Hello, welcome to today's RTA webinar recording in collaboration with Queensland Building and Construction Commission and what you need to know about pool safety in rental properties. My name is Lynn from the communication and education team of the RTA. Today we will be looking at Queensland tenancy law and how it relates to pool safety. Our guest speaker will look at pool safety laws and certificates, compliance and key information for landlord and tenants and regarding their responsibilities and also where to get more helpful information on today's topic. Please note the RTA cannot provide legal advice and you are encouraged to seek your own independent advice to make informed decisions. The RTA is pleased to be working with QBCC and today's guest speaker is Sue Crozier. Sue is a senior investigator with the Compliance and Enforcement section of QBCC and has a wealth of knowledge for all things pool safety. So on behalf of the RTA and the rental sector watching today, Sue, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Lynn. It's great to be here. So before I hand over to Sue to go through today's presentation, I'm just going to quickly touch on the tenancy laws and how it relates to pool safety. So the Residential Tenancies and Roomy Accommodation Act outlines the rights and responsibilities for everyone involved in the tenancy. So for property owners, one of their obligations is going to ensure that the rental property is in good repair, fit to live in, and not in breach of any health or safety laws at the start of the tenancy. Also during the tenancy, they must continue to maintain the property by doing the repairs and general maintenance. It's not uncommon to also see special terms in a tenancy agreement on who's responsible for what with the day-to-day -day operation of a pool. And remember, as always, with any special terms, ensure that they do not contradict the tenancy legislation. The Act also allows for the manager or the owner or tradesperson to enter to comply with the compliance and maintenance of the rental property. So the tenant must be given 24 hours notice for the entry. And the tenants have obligations to ensure they don't do damage and also report any maintenance issues to their property manager or the owner. The weather's warming up and with that comes the blow up or the portable pools for the backyard. There are compliance requirements for these and our guest speaker today is going to talk more about that during her presentation. So on that note, so I'm going to hand over to Sue from QBCC to provide really helpful information for both property owners, property managers and tenants. Thanks, Lynn. So in relation to the commencement of the pool safety laws, they came out in 2010. Uh, there was a graduated introduction process, um, which finalised in 2015. The graduated introduction process was based around what the classification was of the building was. So in other words, whether it was a class three, which is a, a shared accommodation property, or uh, whether it was a single residential property, which is a class one. Uh, and of course, whether the property was rented or sold or had an owner occupation status. There are approximately 400,000 pools in Queensland at the moment. Um, and of course, as Lynn alluded to, uh, the weather's warming up. And so we hope we're going to be using our swimming pools for cooling off, relaxing, and maybe getting that bit of extra exercise. Unfortunately though, swimming pools can be a real danger to small children and that's why these laws were introduced. Definitely though, supervision of young children and teaching them to swim is certainly the, the, one of the, the, um, the safest aspect of, of protecting small children. But essentially this is why the rules have come, come about because young children who are unsupervised do get into pool areas and of course do or can get themselves into great difficulty. The Queensland Building Com Construction Commission is responsible for regulating and licensing of the pool safety inspectors. Local governments, on the other hand, have wide ranging authority to enter the properties, inspect barriers, and they can take enforcement action against non-compliant barriers if they're found. In relation to the actual requirement for pool safety certificates, it's important to understand that there are two categories of pools. That is the non-shared and the shared. Shared pools, sorry, non-shared pools means that the pool is only used by the occupants of the home associated with the pool. And shared, a shared pool is a pool used by 
residents of a unit complex or similar. Owners of rental properties need to have the pool barrier inspected and a certificate issued. The timing depends on whether the property is a shared pool or a non-shared pool. And I'll cover that information in our next slides. Inspection of barriers is undertaken by pool safety inspectors who are licensed by the QBCC. You can check the currency for pool safety certificate on the QBCC pool register. And as I mentioned earlier, it's important to know that the local government authority have wide ranging powers to, powers to enter properties and they can inspect barriers and take action if there's no certificate for that property. In relation to leasing of non-shared pools, there are different requirements for the shared and non-shared in terms of when the certificates are required, but ultimately they're both required to be inspected and have a certificate issued. For the lease of a non-shared pool, a certificate must be obtained before the lease is signed. There's no alternative, there's no, um, there's no ifs or buts about that. It must be that the certificate is obtained before the lease is signed. If no certificate were in place at the time of the lease being signed for a non-shared pool, owners can be and are penalised uh, for an amount of over $2,000. And also if a property manager is found to have commenced a lease without a certificate in place, the property manager uh, may have disciplinary action commenced against them under the Property Occupations Act. QBCC does perform validation checks against the pool safety register and assessment of bond payments to determine, lease, to determine when leases have commenced. That's how we can determine um, uh, who is non-compliant or compliant in terms of when their lease has commenced. Okay. So, Sue, so you sort of like in just summarising for our audience for the terminology, the non-shared pools are usually your freestanding houses and the shared pools are usually those for like your unit and apartment and townhouse complexes. Exactly, Lynn, that's correct, yeah. So for leasing of a shared pool, and that is where the, where the property, as Lynn alluded to, uh, is, is shared. So the pool is used by other residents of that property. So in other words, a unit complex managed by a body corporate is a great example. Now, so there's a lease can commence without there being a pool safety certificate, but only if the owner of the pool has given a Form 36. Form 36 is a notice of no pool safety certificate. And that form needs to be given to the incoming tenant, the body corporate, and also to QBCC to notify that in fact, there is no pool safety certificate there. Now the issuing of the form 36 gives the body corporate the additional time of 90 days in which to obtain a pool safety certificate. But the body corporate should always maintain that, that the barrier is compliant, whether there is a certificate in place or not. The QBCC has issued several infringement notices for people that have found uh, to have not issued a Form 36 when they should have. In regard to compliance, one of the QBCC's roles is licensing and disciplining, disciplining the pool safety inspectors. As you can see on the slide, there's been over 42 inspectors who've been disciplined this year alone. Um, and we do have a pool safety inspector search tool and we encourage homeowners and property managers to interrogate that tool so that they can find out the details of the pool safety inspector and some history about um, any disciplinary action if it has occurred. Just in terms of the allegations that may be made against the pool safety inspector, one of the most common that QBCC finds is that there's been a certificate issued when the pool in fact was not compliant. And of course, that is a big problem and that is certainly one of the key aspects of, of my role as a senior investigator with the pool safety unit of QBCC. 
And as I mentioned earlier, local governments also have a very important role in terms of inspecting barriers and they have um, authority to actually enter properties and inspect if there's a suspicion, suspicion that the pool is dangerous. QBCC has a lot of uh, pool safety information available on its website. One of the most recent things that we've developed is this property managers checklist. And although it's entitled a property managers checklist, it is applicable for use with homeowners um, and in fact, anyone who really wants to get more uh, information um, and, and use the checklist as a, a guide about how to maintain uh, and, and manage that their, their own pool is safe. It's also even useful for tenants for that matter. It covers um, what you need to tell your tenants about their responsibility, including their legal responsibilities, and not doing anything to the pool barrier, which would, they, which would render it to be non-compliant. Uh, and that includes putting things like child play equipment, uh, pot plants, parking a car too close to the pool barrier, things like that, which can all become quite a dangerous situation and allow a small child to climb up and over the barrier. So Sue, so I understand like, you know, pool safety is very important. So whether you're the owner or a tenant. So one of the questions I've heard many times over the years is why aren't the canals or the creeks and dams near houses and other open waterways, why aren't they not fenced? Yeah, Lynn, that's a good question, and it's a common question that we're faced with um, at QBCC. Look, the legislation is primarily about protecting um, the children who are associated with a residential property. So in other words, the pool is a part of a residential property, and that is why the pool itself uh, needs to be uh, uh, fenced in association with that residential property. It's obviously um, just simply not possible to, uh, in the regional areas, for example, to fence along creeks um, and even along some of our waterways. An example here in Brisbane, if I can just use Brisbane as an example, the South, uh, South Bank uh, waterway there, that, there's no residential accommodation associated with that particular waterway. So therefore, there's no requirement for that to be fenced. It's not to say it's not dangerous, but the legislation is that there's no requirement for that to be fenced because it's not associated with a residential property. And you mentioned before, like, I mean, the very, the importance of, you know, particularly the children that's actually renting in the properties, whether they can swim or not swim. Yeah. Do you have any statistics or anything you can share with our um, audience about, like, any deaths that's actually occurring or... Yeah, the, the importance of why we do have these um, barriers in place. Mm. Unfortunately, Lynn, I do, um, and QBCC and obviously local governments um, have to deal with the unfortunate circumstances of children um, uh, and immersion incidents as a result of the child getting into the pool barrier. Look, unfortunately, pool safety uh, or, or children drowning in pools is one of the leading causes of death yeah, for children under five years of age. Uh, in Queensland, and I would imagine that would be a very similar statistic um, throughout the whole of Australia. Um, and also in relation to those deaths, it's really important to recognise also that there are seven really tragic incidences or, or uh, near misses that um, also occur as a result of a child getting into the barrier, getting into the pool area. And when I say near misses, I mean children getting into that barrier, getting into the pool, and unfortunately being submerged for too long and they may become uh, or sustain a brain injury, which of course is an, an absolute tragedy. So, so you also mentioned QBCC licenses the pool safety inspectors. And so your website actually has a list of all the inspectors or what does a person do to go find a, a pool safety inspector? Mm. So Lynn, we, we do have on the QBCC website, you can just type in a request or a search function for pool, pool safety inspectors, and that will bring up all an entire list of all of the inspectors within the particular local council regions that you nominate. 
If you select on a particular pool safety inspector, it will also give you some of the contact details and also some of the disciplinary his history if that has, if you're looking for that sort of information. But it's an important tool because it provides the information about where to actually contact the pool safety inspectors. Because at times, sometimes you recognise that you actually need a pool safety in inspector quicker than what perhaps you had originally planned. So it's a good tool to have avail available. In terms of actually does your pool barrier comply, we suggest that whether you're managing the property yourself or whether you've got a property manager engaged, we recommend that you do a, a regular routine check of the barrier as, as frequently as you attend the property. Um, and some of the points that are shown here on this slide are some of the items that we suggest that you look for. Often we find that barbecues, pot plants, children's play equipment, and as I mentioned earlier, even cars are parked too close to the barrier and that that provides then a climbing point um, which a child can use to access into the barrier. So all items need to be a minimum of 900 millimetres away from the barrier on the outside and also 300 millimetres away from the inside. Um, and that, 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 those measurements are legislated and the, the, the common sense practice there is so that a child can't reach to get into or onto an item which would allow them to climb onto the barrier and of course get into the barrier. The heights of the barriers have to be a minimum of 1200, whether it's the fence, the gate, or in fact even the um, uh, balustrade area which may be on, on a balcony which is overhanging the pool area. That's a good one to think about because um, a lot of people don't realise that and don't give that any consideration, but it can certainly be a danger and it certainly is a, a requirement. Also check for gaps underneath the barrier. Um, a lot of times we have found that uh, loose pebbles or garden mulch are, are considered to be acceptable. I can tell you here and now that they're not because I've certainly recognised that small children can easily scrape away that um, those pebbles or mulch and get access into that pool area and of course do themselves um, significant, significant inju injury. Um, also check that there's a CPR resuscitation sign visible from the pool enclosure and able to be read easily. CPR sign is absolutely useless if it is not able to be read easily and, it, and you know, in an emergency situation, that sign can be an absolute lifesaver. So please ensure that it is absolutely visible and easily read. Look for signs that the gate may be being propped open. That's, um, unfortunately, it's an all too common um, uh, circumstance whereby people uh, may be getting their lawnmower out or allowing their dog to use that pool area or whatever. If there's a brick or a rock or something like that placed up against that gate, or even if there's an hockey strap or a, um, a small piece of rope or something, those things are indications that someone might be regularly leaving that gate in a fully open position. And that is absolutely not compliant and a high risk for little children to get into that pool area. Anyone found leaving the gate open, propping the gate open, um, tying the gate back, um, may be penalised up to $20,000. Um, and for a corporation, that fine increases by about five times. So it is a very significant fine because it is a very, very significant and dangerous thing, allowing little children in through the gate. We, select, we suggest that you do regular checking of the gate hinges and the gate lock. While you're there, put a little bit of oil or CRC or one of those sorts of lubricant products on the gate, at, on the gate hinges and on the latch because it encourages that, um, that gate to be maintained in good condition and hopefully prevent those hinges and latches from failing. This little video that we've got here is just a, a demonstration of how to test the gate. And um, uh, it's very short. Mm -hmm. And um, the, we, are, we recommend that you just open the gate just a few centimetres, release the gate and see how it comes back. In this particular video, it's locking nice and securely. And also you will hear 
in real life, you will actually hear that that lock is actually engaging and it's secure. Give a little pull on that gate when you're on the outside. Give a little pull on that gate. Make sure that it is actually permanently and secure, okay? We suggest doing that little pull because little children love to stand on the bottom rail of those gates or barriers. And if their weight is on that gate, it could be pulling that gate down a little bit and it, that may be sufficient to release the lock. So give it a little pull. Make sure that you test it. If you find that that gate is not latching correctly, please don't delay in making arrangements to get your maintenance person or actually get that thing repaired because gates are the primary cause or gate failures are the primary cause of little children getting into those pool areas and of course getting themselves into great difficulty. So Sue, what are the steps to take if the pool barrier is not compliant or there's problems like this with the gate and things like that and mm. no one's fixing it or you know that you, there's some problems there? Okay, so if it's the gate, um, and I'll touch on some other issues in a moment, Lynn, but if it's the gate, look, by all means, secure the gate closed. Use your, use your tie if you're a man. Take your tie off and tie the damn tie around the gate to make sure that it's secure because the last thing you want is, of course, children getting in there. But So secure the gate in a fully closed position. That obviously means that no one can get in there until such time as it is repaired. And as I said, don't delay in getting that repair done. You can put up um, uh, small uh, protective areas of perhaps acrylic sheeting or something similar to that, um, screwed on to, to cover up any gaps. Um, where the barrier might have um, broken palings perhaps or um, there might be a gap under the fence. You can just secure um, shielding of some sort on the outside, importantly on the outside, to prevent kids getting in there. So there are a range of things that can be done and there's no um, nothing to stop you doing that, okay, because you're actually protecting, um, uh, getting little, uh, preventing little children getting in there. In there. If it's a case, Lynn, of where you've um, identified that there is a more significant problem, and that is that you've got perhaps got a concern that the barrier was inspected previously, and there may it and there may be, for example, another pool safety inspector who's come along and they've decided that no, it's not compliant. Now you can raise a formal complaint with QBCC if that is the case. If it's and you're most welcome to do that, and I, as a senior investigator, will most likely be the person to receive that complaint, um, and I'll certainly deal with it, looking at all of the evidence and determining exactly what has gone on. If, on the other hand, you've got a, 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 a significant issue that you feel that someone has damaged the fence or damaged the gate, by all means, you can contact local government and make arrangements for a local government compliance officer to come out and inspect um, and they can make a decision about what has gone on with that particular fence. Does that answer your question, mm -hmm. Lynn? So with some of these pool gates, um, some of them have gone a bit high tech. Yeah. Some have like a keypad access to the gate instead of your standard pull up latch that you've just showed in this video. Mm. Is that okay? Or, you know, or is there certain rules that that um, keypad access has to be at? Yeah, Lynn, look, it's a good question you raise. Um, so with the keypads, what I what I believe you're talking about is perhaps, say, a body corporate situation or a resort or something like that, whereby they're trying to, the owners are trying to actually prevent people, that unauthorised people, gaining access to the pool. So with a keypad or even a swipe card situation, they are acceptable is as long as the actual height of that keypad or swipe card pad is at a minimum of uh, 1500 above the ground level. That's the general ruling. Um, there are more technical details, which of course we don't have time to go into, but in general, yes, make sure that those uh, keypads or swipe pads are 1500 millimetres above the ground level. Interestingly on that point though, Lynn, there's also a lot more technical details about pool safety because we're only talking here about outdoor pools, but hey, what about indoor pools? They're a whole nother kettle of fish, but they do need to uh, also be uh, inspected and have certificates. Good question, Lynn.
So moving now on to tenant responsibilities, as I've said, the responsibility for clients for, for compliance with pool safety laws rests with the owner of the pool. Okay, so if a tenant provides a pool, and we all experience that around Christmas time, hey, it's a great idea to get a little uh, portable pool for the little ones to have a paddle paddle in. But look, please do consider that it may well be. Uh, putting those little children in danger. So if the tenant provides a pool, it is their responsibility to register that pool with the QBCC and most importantly, to maintain a safe barrier around that pool. This again, the significant penalties if a person is found to have a non-compliant barrier, even for this little tiny uh, portable pool. So. There are uh, minimum depths or maximum depths that are, are required in terms of deciding or determining whether it is actually a swimming pool. And um, often the, the pools that hold more than 300 millimetres in depth of water, so one foot level of water, means generally speaking that it is a swimming pool and it will be required to have a barrier. Remembering also that local government authorities do have powers to enter a property. So if someone makes a complaint to local government, they can local government can well enter a property, determine whether that is a non-compliant pool uh, and whether there's a non-compliant pool barrier, and there will be enforcement action taken. So I know I've heard from many property managers and owners that they've turned up for an inspection at a rental property and found that the tenant has propped open the pool gate with a pot plant or a chair. So you've mentioned before, like, you know, can't do that. So what actually happens in that situation? What would the owner need to do? Yeah, so the owner needs to take, first and foremost, um, needs to take action to immediately rectify that situation. So it's the owner's property, and I would suggest that the owner would have every right. You can correct me if I'm wrong here, Lynn, but if it's a safety issue, um, they should be able to remove that thing which is um, opening the, or leaving that gate prop, propped open. They should also report the event to the local government because as I said, local government do have the right and will come and inspect and um, in some situations they will find um, the, the, the person who's willfully interfered with that particular barrier. So um, it is a very, very serious matter um, and there are certainly very serious penalties for that. And of course, the most serious penalty or the most serious event or outcome is that a little child unfortunately gets into that pool and, um, and is found um, in, in the water. So you've mentioned about portable pools. So these are, you know, someone's gone to the local Big W or department store or a pool shop and purchase what, like a portable pool or a blow-up pool for holiday time and not realising that potential consequences or what's really required. So you've really mentioned that they're going to have to like register the pool, put a barrier up. Um, what else do they need to do? Yeah, so look, you've covered most things there. It is a case of registering the pool. Yes, putting a compliant barrier up um, and of course, with a compliant barrier, they have it's not determined compliant until such time as the certificate is issued. So there is a fair bit involved, and the homeowner, or sorry, the tenants need to be aware of that. It's not as simple as just going to Kmart or Woolies, getting this little portable pool, um, because in fact it's not compliant, and um, and they may find themselves, um, uh, you know, in in very dire circumstances, not only through the injury of their own child perhaps, um, but but having received very, very significant fines. And so what about spas? That's one thing we haven't touched on so far. Mm. What about the spas out there? Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Um, yeah, look, spas are certainly um, considered, or some spas are certainly considered to be a, a, a swimming pool. There, again, you know, there, there's a there's a raft of legislation behind a classification of what a particular, or what a spa is and the definition of a swimming pool, which we don't have time to go into and we're really not here to go into the, that level of detail in. I'm sure you appreciate that. But in general, yeah, a spa is certainly a swimming pool and it does need to be 
be um, appropriately registered. It does need to be fenced and uh, certificates do need to be issued. So we've covered a fair bit of information here, um, but uh, we, we've certainly limited it to, to really what, what we thought you would like to know. But I'm sure there are many other questions. And what I'd like to just in, make sure that you're aware of is QBCC does have a lot more information available for homeowners, tenants, um, and, and property managers, and even pool safety inspectors available on, on the website. Um, we're also here to provide um, answers to some questions, specific questions, if you have got them. We cannot give site-specific advice, though, um, even though I personally am well experienced and our team are well experienced um, in providing advice and information, we can't give site-specific advice, okay? So the website address is up there about what you can, how you can get further information from QBCC. Great. Thanks again, Sue. Like, this is really important information for everyone in the rental sector because obviously, you know, we're a warmer climate, Queensland has. So there's a good chance that there's rental properties out there with a pool or with a growing amount of like apartments um, with shared pools and things like that. So the RTA does highly recommend you download the checklist that Sue provided up before and also to the view the information on the QBCC website for all things with pool safety. So just in finalising today's presentation, just make sure you understand your rights and responsibilities under Queensland Tenancy Law and pool safety is important for both the property manager, the property owner and the tenants. And remember there are penalties applied for willfully interfering with a pool barrier. So no propping open the gate with a pot plant because it's convenient. Um, so again, remember the penalties for also not even having the barriers up in the first place if you decide to put up one of those portable pools. And download that checklist and safety booklet from the QBCC website. So you can keep connected with the Residential Tenancies Authority by subscribing to the RTA News and you can also link with the RTA on LinkedIn. The RTA is here to help you and everyone involved in a tenancy, so we encourage you to be informed about your rights and obligations and view the RTA's website at rta.qld.gov.au. It's got a lot of information, resources and forms, and you can also log into the RTA web services for all matters on bonds, including your lodgements and refunds. And if you need further assistance, please contact us on 1300 366 311, Monday to Friday, 8.30am to 5pm. So thank you to the team at QBCC for their collaboration in this recording, and thank you for your time today, Sue. You're welcome, Lynn. Great to be here. Thank you.